Fresh and untitled. Hello? Can you hear me in the cheap seats in Ireland? <laughs> so I have a question for you that kind of came up there at one stage in something. Am I the, per- the only person, the only writer who every time, say you've decided, right, I'm going to write tonight, and you sit down to write, and just as you sit down to write, you get that awful feeling in your stomach saying, what if I can't do it? What if it doesn't work tonight? What if, like, all my writing is gone? What if I've lost it? Am I the only one in the world who does that? I do that all the time. I don't need to be sitting down to write to have that happen. I can be eating breakfast. I can be chopping a tomato. I can be walking the dog. So and... much slip where, where I sit down and I'll go, what if nothing comes? What if it's just, like, all gone? What if I've written all that I have to write and everything has gone away and it's never going to happen again and I have to be a shopkeeper forever or something? <laughs> okay, hi. Okay, Zebo, zombies on a sub. Do you know how hard that is to top? <laughs> like everybody's like, that's the best book. You'll never write anything better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. That's fantastic. No, it's so high concept. It's never been done. You'll never come up with a better idea. Thank you. You're awesome. Kind of like uh, Bram Stoker. He wrote Dracula, and like it, it, it's. He's got loads of books out, but nobody knows anything about him. Like, do you know what I mean? And um, it's so sad, do you know, because like it was his first book and it made him and it broke him because everybody was like, oh, this was a good book, but it was no Dracula. Yeah. You know, so he could never top his own book. He killed himself with his own book, like, you know, and that's like, oh, you poor fucker. Again, that's, that's something we all worry about, but the biggest worry I have now, whenever I, I start writing or continue a project is thinking, who the bloody hell's going to buy this? I've, I've been watching um, all of the uh, the previous videos you've had, and like you, Emma, it's learned certain things, but also confirmed certain things. And what what is confirmed is, is is actually made me feel a lot more relieved. It's always thinking, am I absolutely nuts to in this? Phew! Thank God for that. No, Jessica McHugh does it. David Moody does it. Fantastic. And it's so easy to incorporate weather. You know, you can have a character grab an umbrella or grab a pair of sunglasses, and it's a very subtle way to say that it's sunny out or that it's raining, and to let the reader get more involved because they obviously know what it's sunny or if it's raining. And it's just, it's another way to, to bring them into the story. It, it, it's going back to what you are saying earlier about, um, about creating an atmosphere. And again, um, at, at school, we, we were taught to use weather a lot, but um, we did it in a very cat handed way. You know, um, you would think off the top of your head, right, okay, well, what time of day is this happening? What period, sorry, what season is this happening? Why is it cold outside? Is it winter outside? So you would start off describing what was happening and, and you, you would describe the uh, the landscape and uh, and how the weather's affected it. But you would still feel disconnected. And it just felt like um, it, was, it was a label. Okay, right. it was a bog standard scenario. Put a sticker on it. It was sunny. Another sticker. Uh, it was cold. Uh, clear sky, so there was a frost, but no snow. Now, I'm not a fan of Jane Austen, but we read that at school, and we were told, right, look at the way she uses weather as a part of her books, because see how her characters react to the weather. But it's going to take longer than three hours because I have to stop and cut you out and then start again and go again, and you know, it's going to take like. Right, well, like, that, trouble now. that was like paranormal activity shit. I know. And I know it's trouble because I, I tried opening this with a pop opener. 
it's a screw cap as you would do with um, a bottle of wine. This is. Um, that's what happened? Don't get too excited. It's, it's only Sainsbury's this own. This is the best thing I've it. ever seen. You what? <laughs> Me and her were just talking. I sit down with a bottle of cider and you're falling about pissing yourselves like, come on, what's up? Share the joke. I'm getting paranoid here. My eyes are burning. You're Kids fucking on... paranoid. Hey. <laughs> we were just sitting there talking and it was just the two of us. And it was just us. Time, so you disappeared just on the screen. And then literally... Like, your screen was you holding up a beer. Like, there was no you entering, no you sitting. It was straight out of paranormal activity. It was creepy as shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> scared the shit out of me. It's a good job we weren't bitching about it. I scared you. Oh, God. I thought you were just laughing at me. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Anyway. So I can now safely assume that your computer is more than likely possessed. <laughs> yeah, so that's how to create an atmosphere, um... kids. <laughs> For me at the moment, uh, whether it's um, it's a part of uh, a place, uh, I probably don't use it as effectively as I should. But uh, but again, it, it, it just illustrates perfectly what you said uh, until you had another professional pair of eyes and look at what you've written, then you realise where you were lacking on using a certain thing that we normally take for granted. It was also like the, the location, you know, like uh, some of my favourite books like Jasper Ford, you know, The Iron Affair. I mean, that is probably my top, if not top three, if not my, my top book that I love. And it's because the character talks about the weather all the time. I don't know if that's because she's British or not, but, you know, the, the weather gets incorporated. Um, and secondly, the area that she lives in, like, it's all so goofy, this kind of alternate universe, like, where dodos are alive and they go watch the, the herding of the mammoths. And these things create this town of Swindon, and you just kind of want to go hang out there after a while. You're like, I want to go and put a penny in the Shakespeare machine and have them play a sonnet. And you know, and it's one of the few books I've read where I I familiar with that town. Like I know the people that live there. I know the name of the restaurant. I know what their their cheese smugglers. I'm just little tiny things that he has put into the story to create this very rich world. And and that's what this editor told me is she's like you have to do things like that. You have to get the reader involved and feel like okay they're at the diner. What makes because for me I have the alternate universe and Moonlight Killer. So it was very important to build that and make the reader know that, okay, this isn't just like some small town. There's something a little off kilter. And, you know, one of the ways that she had me introduce that without, you know, telling, showing and all that was have one of the main characters do something simple, go into a diner and look at the bulletin board and have them read a couple of the flyers. And, well, they might not be normal. And why is there a clove of a string of garlic hanging above the front door instead of a bell, you know, just little things like that, that kind of make the reader start. Oh, that's not really typical. You know, that's kind of, why is there a Bigfoot bowling league flyer? Like that's odd, you know? And, and I can see that it makes a difference because now when I read a book after talking with her, I pay attention to that. And it's like, and it's really kind of sad because a lot of writers that I used to enjoy, I'm like, Oh, you didn't use any weather in your book. Yeah. <laughs> Have a character read something on the billboard. Now, I'll read it out. To us, it seems a bit weird, but is that character's reaction to it that speaks volumes? To them, it might be, you know, completely normal. Oh bloody! Oh, the B four one six is clogged up. Then bloody mammoth herd is again. There is zombies and vampires and dracules. It's been done. Be off with you. Z boat. Yeah. Okay. I, I wrote that. There were a lot of reasons I wrote that book. I had to force myself to do it. In the second and the third books, it was the same thing. And then after that, I was invited to write a book. And 
So then you get people that want you to write all these zombie books. And I was just like, after writing four of them, I was like, yeah, I'm done. Like, I don't have another zombie book in me. I I don't want to become that person. I can't churn all this shit out. (laughs) Yeah. And it's... That's kind of why I'm happy to stay a genreless writer. <clears throat> a lot mm-hmm. of people say to me, like, what do you write? And I'm like, well, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a horror writer because, like, I don't do, like, oh, monsters with tentacles and gore and flash and all this crap. Like, if I'm going to say horror, I'll say psychological, but I would probably go more thriller, mystery kind of shit. And, but I still kind of find it hard to pigeonhole myself into that, like, because I've written, like, as you, as you said, like, I've written some, like, fairy tale fantasy and all this crap, like, and I'm kind of happy to stay that way because, you know, even with J.K. Rowling, like, she, she done the Harry Potters and was, like, phenomenally amazing and everybody loves it. And for her to step away from that now is, like, you know, her new book, Camera Model, or her recent book, Camera Model, was called, everybody's like, oh, shit. Because it wasn't Harry Potter, and that's it, like, you know? It's trying to break away from this, I am I am the, the, the author of Zed Boat. Yeah, and, you know, and, and it's not that I dislike it or don't appreciate the people that do read it. It's just uh, I found that, like, Emma, she doesn't want to be known as a horror writer or anything. I, me too. I would like to be genre-free zone. Like, if I want to write humor one day or horror or sci-fi, you know, I want to write what I have fun writing. Mm-hmm. And the Moonlight Killer series, I adore it. You know, like, I love those characters. I consider them my friends. That probably makes me crazy. But, like, <laughs> but like after writing three books, I feel like I know them so well. It must be really and, hard to kill them off, eh? Yeah, well, I'm not George R. R. Martin. <laughs> what both of you said there is you're not tied to one particular genre. Um, do you think, I mean, now, personally, I think that that's going to make you better writers. Because, Hope so. yeah, oh, yeah. But also, have you found that when you're writing in different genres, you're using the same styles and techniques you used in one genre, or are you finding uh, you're writing, using different uh, different ways of writing? The, the fundamentals of storytelling are still the same, aren't they? I find when I started writing the story for Steve for Cabbage, um. I was really nervous starting it because I'm thinking kids are reading this, so I have to be careful with like big words and things like that, or words they understand and stuff. But once I like got into the flow of it, I found that it kind of became all right. Um, I think I use the same my same style. I just tailor it a bit, if that makes sense. Is crossover the future? Because apart from science fiction and fantasy, it's very, very hard to sell a certain genre book. Horror writers find it very, very difficult in the UK. Um, Certain horror writers have now signed on agencies. People like Simon Bestwick in the UK, very respected, very talented writer, very well known for his horror stuff. But he signed on with an agency, and what he's writing for them is a crime novel. Uh, My friend Frank Duffy, again, horror writer, he signed on with the Xeno Agency. He's writing a crime novel because horror is is a tough sell. Everybody else that we've spoken to, when asked this question, their answer has been predominantly no. But I know you. So, research and the importance of effective storytelling. Ooh, research. Yes. Um... You see how happy you could just tell it was like, oh, like, yeah, because he had a nerve, he it was it. like, really, it was like a little bit of like a, like a writing gasm there. I, I it, think he came a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> again, it depends what you're writing because, um, as it, with me, cause uh, I'm writing a lot of uh, historical stuff. Now the research yeah. is, is, it's, it is vital. Um, what I've found now is, I have to do the research before writing. And beforehand, um, certain things like uh, The Caretakers, which uh, is a modern day story and uh, required research into the Cambridge colleges, I could do that afterwards. I, I wrote the story, did the research afterwards. It was basically filling in the gaps and adding detail. The, uh, the pitfall to that is 
when you're researching something and you discovered something which could completely scupper the narrative. So in Cambridge colleges, it's it's not necessarily an issue, but say you're writing a, um, a spy thriller and it's all dependent on, um, on, on the current state of the world and your narrative, you've planned it all out, everything is spot on. It has to be planned out, you can't just freestyle it. And you suddenly realised that there was a certain law or a black spot in a certain country which you weren't aware of, which basically meant your story is no longer plausible. They just kind of like write a story and they say, oh, I'm going to have it take place in New York, 1972. And it's like, they just kind of like hope for the best. And I'm just kind of thinking in my head, oh my God, like you can't do that's that. The reason, that's the main reason why I don't actually, a lot of my stories are not set in a set place because I do so much research on like, okay, so I'm setting it this time. So what would be an appropriate name for a character to have back then? Like, I'm not going to call it something like fucking Taylor Swift back in 63. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I, I research names, I research surnames, research this, that, and the other thing. And then if I'm going to set it in an exact place, in an exact date, I'm like, oh, fuck, i got to do all that research as well. So no, I'll just make it somewhere. And then well, dude, buddy, I'm making, I am completely making up the place where my story <laughs> takes place. Like, I don't got to research shit. No, fuck that. You they do enough like, research anyway. A lot of writers, if they're writing a modern day story, they'll try and make it in a, in a generic area uh, and, and a modern day thing. It, it always goes back to that right what you know thing when you're writing something in the past um as i said the research is essential but what is harder is it is harder to write something in the recent past than it is in the long past because there have been absolutely hundreds of books written about the english civil war thousands on trafalgar on on, on uh, naval history maritime combat in the 18th century where it's, say I was uh, going to write something in 1972, that would be more terrifying for me because, I mean, okay, I will know all the uh, all the main events, what was going on, but it, it's the detail. Um, how much would a, a pack of uh, 20 Embassy number one cigarettes cost? Uh, now, this is the year just after decimalization took in. There were people still struggling with pounds, shilling, and some pence. How do you get into that mindset? Now, and obviously the people who, who were old at that time they've all gone so you don't have that first-hand narrative to draw on this is terrifying that would scare the shit out if someone says right chamberlain i want you to write something in 1969 blah 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 <laughs> oh no oh. <laughs> um, the hardest thing about research of course is to make that blend seamlessly into the narrative so that when someone's reading it, they can just pick up the details, but not thrown out of the story. That is so, that is so hard to do. But research itself, um, yeah, I absolutely love it. Just ju ju just reading and. Um, well, no, the reason I also ask this because you've been well for about a, well two years maybe I guess you've been writing a lot of alternative history war stories. Uh, you're recently getting into pirate stories, so you obviously research for that, you know, uh, World War II, uh, pirates, the sea, the ships that they were on. I'm assuming that has something to do with your new hobby of shipbuilding. <laughs> One feeds into the other without that. <laughs> it's, you know, but um, does it slow you down? Does it make it easier? Do you like it? Are there certain methods of research that are better than others? It's what I found is um, because I picked on a period of history that interested me. So doing the research didn't feel like a chore. It wasn't an uphill grind thinking, oh, I've got to read this to make the bloody thing convincing. It was just a period that fascinated me. So the idea of uh, learning more about it was just golden. It's wonderful. So um, I find that, um, who, who is this Tim Horton bloke anyway? I gave you Timbits when you were here. The little tiny donuts, Timbits. Oh, I thought he was someone who's kicked off Serenity or something. I don't know. No, Timbits. It's, it's, um, it's a donut Look shop. Look at that voice. I like being questioned. 
Yeah, I know. Adrian has more questions. He actually had a list. Uh, Emma, you didn't get to give your input, actually. I'm going to take my moment because you guys have gone to the bathroom 17 times since we've been oh. sitting here. <laughs> Mr. Chamberlain. What? Oh, <laughs> this is like the best internet ever. This is the best episode we've ever done. <laughs> I love this episode. <laughs> He's <laughs> so what we need to do now is we need to do a wrap up. And then stop recording so Emma doesn't have, like, eight hours of footage to go through. We're still filming. I thought it was just general chat and shoot the breeze. I thought we'd uh, done all the boring stuff. We're still working. Mm, What? The boring stuff? Are you saying that your experience on Fresh and Untitled was not invigorating and fun? It was was mind-blowing. It's absolutely fantastic. (laughs) Um, and that it was happened. only ruined by Microsoft's cruel invasion of Skype, bastards. You will not monetize me, you cunts. <laughs> and that is a wrap. <laughs> and that's the wrap. Okay, then. <laughs> Good job, guys.